Hey, how are you doing? Welcome to uh, episode 83 of Mark Talks About His Stuff. Today is Sunday. I think it's the 18th of April, 2021, and I'm not going to be doing a music episode today. Today, I'm going to be talking about the films of David Lynch, although obviously this is one of his CDs. You'll also notice a strange and unusual thing in the background, which is the actual sun. So I'm not sitting in here with the lights off or the lights on late at night. Uh, it's about 6.30 at night now on a Sunday in April and the sun is setting way over there. Um, and I think this is in uh, cinema terms called the golden hour, the hour where everything happens and looks most fantastic. Um, but more correctly, um, I have decided to avoid watching uh, episodes of CSI Law and Order downstairs and instead to talk about one of my favourite filmmakers and the uh, the ranking in which I prefer his films. So David Lynch has made, I think, 10 feature films. Uh, he's made about 4,000 short movies um, and he's made two TV series um, as well as a number of other uh, perhaps less immediately obvious works. Now, in order for me to do this correctly, I have to turn this huge pile of DVDs upside down uh, and start with the one which I think is, is probably my least favourite of his works. But my least favourite of his works is probably also his least well known. And so therefore, I'm going to introduce you to uh, something which you may not have heard of his, uh, which, by the way, I didn't even know existed until last week. It is called The Hotel Room by David Lynch. Um, and it was a, a short three episode anthology TV show that broadcast in America on the 8th of January 1993 and the hotel room is uh, three short films each about half an hour long uh, detailing events and incidents that have happened in room 603 of one spe specific um, particular hotel uh, over a 57 year period uh, the three episodes two of which are directed by David Lynch and the third one well, the, mid the middle episode is directed by somebody else whose name I have forgotten because I read it and then forgot it. Um, but the hotel room is really, really difficult to find and is by no means his best work at all. So uh, to give you a, an idea around that, it was only released on Laserdisc in Japan and it was released on VHS in America and it was broadcast, I think, on HBO in America once. It's not been given a domestic uh, release in the UK. Uh, it's not been given a DVD release or a Blu-ray release at any point. It is pretty much a, for a forgotten film, or um, although it's really an anthology that was broadcast on television. Uh, and the, the other thing around it is that it's it's not particularly good, actually. Um, around about the mid nineties, um, there's also there was also a film called Four Four Rooms, which was Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez. Um, and a couple of other directors, again, doing a film set in a hotel that was an anthology with four short half-hour stories that's in it. And if you don't have an understanding of the Quentin Tarantino movies, uh, or more correctly, you can't have a full understanding of his movies unless you've watched Four Rooms. And Four Rooms, by the way, was, I think, at the time it came out, one of the sweariest movies of all time. Uh, but it's also not particularly good. The Hotel Room by David Lynch isn't particularly good, Um the two episodes that are directed by David Lynch are OK, but just OK. And they're more like experimental short films with narrative as opposed to um, having any of the, the payoff that you would get out of a feature length um, it release. And so therefore, The Hotel Room is OK and you can find it on YouTube and it's worth what you pay for it to, to watch it on YouTube. It's not necessarily worth owning. So that's the I think I'm going to call that number 13. I think, in in, uh, in the ranking of David Lynch stuff. And by the way, I haven't watched all the short films. Uh, number 12 is uh, his most recent feature film, 2006's Inland Empire. Um, I really struggled watching this the other day. Uh, and the reason that I really, really struggled watching Inland Empire is that it, it's, its script is non-existent. Um, so, for example... The main ideas and the main storylines that run through the movie were kind of thought of and agreed up when it was being financed, uh, but the script itself didn't exist. So sometimes the, the actors were improvising, sometimes David Lynch was telling people what to do there and then with no actual script. Uh, I think the um, the actor Julian Theroux, who I think is in it, uh, said he, do he, he doesn't really know what the film's about. He's going to find out when he watched it. Um, and to be honest, having watched it, I don't quite know what it's about either. It is most... It, it, to 
tackle the wording that's on the cover of this box. It may be a work of genius, but it, the work itself is not genius. David Lynch may be a genius. This film, definitely not. Really, really difficult to follow this. It also suffers from another couple of things which I find particularly uh, annoying. The first one is Inland Empire uh, is shot on uh, digital video. And so it looks really, really rough when you watch it now. The quality just doesn't look very good. It looks very grainy, very low res. Um, it's shot very artlessly. Um, and it, it looks like it was done on the run. Um, and the plot doesn't make a huge amount of sense either. As far as I can work out, um, it's, a, it's about uh, an actress that takes a role in a film that is a remake of an unfinished German film called 47. The film is meant to be cursed. Um, and so therefore, during the making of the film, uh, the remake, which is directed by Jeremy Irons, cursed things happen. And it, it all gets a bit weird. And there's a couple of scenes where I was kind of watching it and going... That has no connection whatsoever to anything else that's happening in the rest of the movie. It's just there because David Lynch thought, I need a one-armed woman and maybe a guy in a rabbit costume and a lawnmower. And, and then shot something and then decided at what point it was going to be least jarring to the rest of the film. Uh, Inland Empire is not narratively satisfying. It's more a kind of abstract. It's like watching a dream, actually. You know, when you fall asleep and you're dreaming and weird stuff happens and none of it makes any sense and suddenly you find out that you're climbing up an eight-foot high wall to go and find a man who's dressed as a panda uh, who's going to be able to tell you the secret of life and when you get there it turns out he's actually a small fluffy tank. It's it's that kind of movie. It, it, it's, not, um, it's not a standard narrative at all. I, I struggle really, really hard. To, to follow this and by the way I mean David Lynch is a very great filmmaker and, and when you watch his, his other movies what you'll be able to see is that he's a great filmmaker who also knows all the conventions and just wants to be weird and experimental um, and sometimes the experiments turn out to be successes and sometimes they don't this is one of the ones that doesn't um, it, it's a great mood piece it's a great thing to just kind of sit down and watch for three hours whilst you know, your mind endlessly wanders around inside your own head, but it's not a great movie, I'm afraid to say. It feels more like a condensed version of an aimless TV show. It's like if somebody tried to take all the episodes of EastEnders uh, and convert them into a three-hour cinematic epic called The Walford Chronicles. Uh, that's what Inland Empire kind of feels like. There's no real plot. There's no real start or end or resolution. And at some points it feels like um, Laura Dern has fallen into the movie that they're making and has ceased to exist as a real person. It's all a bit weird. Uh, I like it, but it doesn't make any sense whatsoever and it's my least favourite of his movies. Now, that would make it, I think, number 12. Uh, number 11, this one will surprise some of you. Uh, this is meant to be a classic and it undoubtedly is a classic, but it's not a classic to me. It's Eraserhead, uh, the first David Lynch movie made in 1977 and you can see I still haven't taken the price tag off where I bought the DVD about 15 years ago because I can't be bothered and in fact I've, I've spent more time talking about the price tag on Eraserhead now than I have given any thought to Eraserhead's price tag previously. This is a great movie, it's really difficult, really original, really disturbing, got some unforgettably dangerous horrific images and it, it's really kind of like taps into the same kind of vein that David Cronenberg did with his body horror movies in the 70s um, except this one actually if you've been a parent or if you've lived with children or you, you've, you've lived with bringing up your own children or you're a responsible parent that spends uh, time living under the same roof as your children and getting up in the middle of the night to feed them eraser head to me feels like a veiled attempt at an autobiography about how difficult it is to be a parent as there's a family that are in this movie that are terrorized by this weird strange baby creature that never sleeps always crying always demanding attention unable to articulate what it is that that it needs to satisfy it and having been a, a sleepless parent um fueled by caffeine and spite um, it, sound, it seemed very, very reminiscent to me of, of when my children were born and they didn't sleep all through the night and I was spent my life in a perpetual state of being knackered. Um, it's a very good film, but it is difficult and weird and not at all pleasant to watch. Um, and it really was a labour of love uh, for David Lynch. So we're going to go to, I think it's number 10 now. Number 10 uh, is, is Wild at Heart. Um, this is a, a really linear, straightforward film around 
effectively kind of teenage rebellion, being out of your depth. Um, and it's kind of like a, a remake or an adaptation of uh, some well-known fairy tales. Um, it's it's it got some good moments in it. It's got the fantastic line about my snake skin boots are a symbol of my individuality. Um, and it's got some really unusual scenes in it. Uh, William Defoe just eats the screen as a, a really kind of threatening uh, gangster type. Uh, he's fantastic in it. Um, and it's all... It, it's a good film. But by David Lynch standards, that's not good enough to be in anything near the top five. It's pretty good. Um, but it's hard, it's violent, it's dark, it's weird. And it's got some really unusual things to say about parenthood, identity, letting go of your children and letting them be their own people. Um, and it, it's really actually a film, I think, around a very, very possessive mother who's trying to control her daughter uh, and how unsuccessful that ultimately turns out to be. Uh, it's quite good. I like it, but it's not easy. Right. Number number nine, uh, we're starting to get into the classic stuff here. Um, Lost Highway. I love this film, although it makes no sense whatsoever. In fact, I could probably say that about every single one of David Lynch's movies. But Lost Highway is a great movie, but it's really difficult to watch. Again, we're seeing some common themes out here. David Lynch makes really, really good movies that are really difficult to follow. Um, I mean, effectively, I think we've got um, Bill Pullman who has uh, a very unusual uh, kind of life. He's accused of his wife's murder um, and he's arrested. And then all of a sudden he somehow turns into uh, a different character who is a young mechanic played by uh, Balthazar Getty. Um, and it, it then kind of the movie flips into, well, what happens if you were a person and you made a certain set of decisions and you want to change that? Almost like if you were given an option to shake the dice and, and be able to be parachuted or transported into somebody else's body and somebody else's life, just like that. Uh, and that's pretty much what Lost Highway does, is it kind of like a transfer into an alternate dimension that looks, feels and acts like the real world that he came from, but is also about 10% off in slightly weird ways. Um, and it's like many of his later films, it's something that you follow and something that you feel as opposed to something that you necessarily expect any kind of narrative payoff. And the film kind of circles back on itself in an infinity loop. So the ending is very, very similar to the beginning and everything starts to make some kind of vague sense. Uh, but again, it feels like watching a film made out of someone's particularly screwed up dreams. Um, I think we're looking at number eight now. Uh, I, I love this film. This is such a, a sweet, lovely film that is often overlooked by people that like David Lynch. And it's classic David Lynch, actually. So lots and lots of things that you'll see in David Lynch movies around, you know, America, personality, countryside, just generally just people being nice to each other and hanging out in America. Um, it's all in the straight story and the straight story is based upon the, the true story of a man that decided he hadn't seen his brother for a very long time. I was going to go and drive to see him, uh, but the only vehicle he had available to him was a lawnmower and he drove across a few hundred miles in a lawnmower to go and see his brother. Um, it's just a, a sweet, straight, sincere film. The straight story describes exactly what it is. It, it, there's no guile in it. There's no experimentation in there. There's nothing that's experimental about it. It's a straightforward, lovely, feel-good movie about the power of family. Um, and I, I really, really enjoy it. It's not his best film, um, but it's it's probably the nicest movie that he's made. And, of course, considering how nasty some of his other movies are, that makes life pretty pretty difficult um seven i think we're at here mulholland drive this was originally uh, filmed as a pilot for a tv show that never took it off um, and you can find the low quality vhs version of the original pilot on youtube if that's what you want to look for which is effectively an alternate uh, cut of this movie um this is a a really strange film about about visiting kind of like the world of of hollywood's underbelly uh, according to the the text that it says on the back there, uh, around you know living in and near Mulholland Drive in Beverly Hills and living and working in that part of the world, um, it's 
not really got a conventional narrative as such. It's got a kind of like a dream reality around it. Things make sense if you think a certain way about them. But again, it's it's like you've been transported into a world that's like the real world, but it's 10% different. And sometimes the 10% is really obvious and sometimes it isn't. Um, it's more of a mood piece to be watched as opposed to anything that's conventional. But it creates its own weird and unusual version of the world, which is absolutely compelling and utterly strange. Um it's it's a good film. It's a really good film. It hasn't got any scenes quite as weird as the restaurant scene in Lost Highway. Uh, but it's uh, but Lost Highway and Mulholland Drive, and to a lesser extent, you know, uh, Inland Empire, all kind of occupy the same kind of space where they're talking about a version of reality that looks like ours but is not ours and is slightly wrong and broken. Um, and we're you know fast coming into into the good stuff now. Although all of it, by the way, is good stuff. Um, my my next favourite, I think this is number seven on the list now, is Blue Velvet. Um, the the movie poster that alongside Betty Blue stood on a thousand student walls when I was much much younger. Um, it's a conventional narrative structure in so much as it's about uh, a hunt for the owner of a missing ear uh, in, in a small town, and it, it is probably the most certainly his. His best movie, probably, up to that point in terms of cinematic craft and style, uh, but not necessarily my favourite of his. There's there's something that's quite adolescent about Blue Velvet. The whole world is seen in, in the film from the point of view of uh, Jeffrey, who is uh, Carl McLachlan's character. Uh, this was the, the second film that um, David Lynch made with Kyle McLachlan in, in the lead. Uh, and it's got this this wonderful, compelling darkness. Dennis Hopper is incredible in this film. Uh, I think Dean Stockwell is in it as well. He is compelling as a different kind of bad guy. Um, Isabella Rossellini appears in it. Obviously, there she is. Uh, and and it's it's you know the nearest thing to an episode of of a murder mystery that I think um, David Lynch has ever got to. Really, it's got some stunning imagery it's got some moments which actually when you watch them and you go i can't believe that anybody thought of that uh it's got some really great symbolism it's it's a great movie it's really good when you, if you're looking for somewhere to start with him that's probably a really really good place to start now we're into what i regard to be uh the last three now i've got my numbers slightly mixed up here and i will explain why when we get to number one uh, but i've got my numbers slightly mixed up because even though i think he's released 13 feature length experiences um i'm uh, the number one choice i've got actually counts for about three of them which I'll, I'll kind of explain when we get there so my third favorite of his his works is june um here is the uk two disc version of the film here is the French three-disc version of the film on DVD. Uh, now, June is by no means well regarded by either David Lynch fans or film fans. You are utterly wrong if you don't rate it highly. Um, there is a, a fan edit of June, which is three hours long, which takes all of the deleted scenes, which are available on the third disc of this set, by the way, and the uh, theatrical version and makes it into the epic that it always could have been. And, and that version of the film, which I will post a link to down there on archive.org, is you know, the film that David Lynch was trying to make with Dune is an undoubted, unbeatable, absolutely classic science fiction epic of, of the type that is rarely, rarely seen and was incredibly well executed. And the finished theatrical version of June has been cinematically castrated and butchered by no-nothing accountants who have decided to slice 45 minutes of useful material out of the movie to squeeze in an extra showing of a film that nobody was going to watch because it didn't make any bloody sense. The theatrical version of June is a pile of steaming garbage that looks beautiful and makes no sense whatsoever. The third disc on this creates a, a television cut of the movie. And in the 80s, uh, it, films were often sold by the minute, so the amount of time that you could get to broadcast it. Um, now, films had, came in extended TV versions all the time in the 80s. It very rarely happens these days. Uh, but if you want to watch them, for example, there's a three-hour version of Superman the movie, uh, which is an extra half an hour in length and adds absolutely nothing to the film. There's a, a TV edit of uh, Superman 2, which is about half an hour longer, 
and is actually really good. There is um, a TV version of Superman 3, not the best movie of all time at all, uh, which runs to two and a quarter hours and has an extra 45-ish minutes of footage in, some of which are good, some of which are absolutely awful. And, and the reason that they did that is so that they could make the films of such a length that they could be shown over two nights on television in America and you could sell more advertising space. And by the way, I very recently watched a TV broadcast from America in 2016 of a documentary about the making of Smokey and the Bandit. And what I found was that there were pretty much advertising breaks every eight or nine minutes. And each advertising break was about four or five minutes long. It got really boring fast forwarding through all of that. Uh, now in the UK there are laws around the amount of advertising per hour of broadcast television that you can have. In America that doesn't quite exist. I remember being uh, zonked off my brain in Los Angeles, in t uh, not, not Los Angeles, Las Vegas in 2003 watching The Simpsons to find that there was um, an advertising break after the first set of credits before the episode actually started. And then there was another advertising break. Then there was another... So you ended up watching The Simpsons and it had three or four advertising breaks in it. Also, by the way, and I, I do remember thinking, this is weird when I was watching it. I was watching uh, the Lethal Weapon movies in the hotel room in Vegas and they showed them in the order of one, two, four and three. I could explain a few things about uh, the American economy. That... Um, but uh, no, TV versions of movies were longer, they had extra padding, they showed you know, finished cuts of pretty much every scene they'd ever shot, a whole bunch of extra scenes that didn't appear in any other version of the movie and didn't advance the plot forward. Uh, and, and for example, you know, um, Superman 3 has a scene where it cuts to people in various countries that are watching television coverage of Superman doing the things that you've just seen for no reason apart from to put an extra five minutes into the movie. Or, or there's a scene where Frank Oz is a doctor, and during the scene where there's a power cut, there's a, you know a, an extra set of dialogue around that, just to pad the movie out. The TV version of Dune is an artless compendium of all of the footage stuck together. David Lynch had the final cut of Dune stolen from him. Uh, which is why he's disowned the movie. He's been asked if he wanted to go back and create a director's cut, and he's declined to do that because he doesn't want to revisit the film, in much the same way that Michael Mann doesn't want to revisit The Keep because he lost the ability to have the final cut about it, and it's too painful. It's like if someone said to me, well, actually, you know, if you want to go back and revisit a relationship and fix it, I'd be like, well, actually, no, I don't. You know, each, each person that's creative has a relationship to that piece of work of art. And being forced to go back and re-experience that sometimes when it brings you nothing but bad memories is not what you want to be doing. Um, the three-hour version of Dune, which I will post a link to, is by far the definitive version of the film. Um, but the three-hour TV cut of it is as close as you can get to it on a physical disc release. And the two-hour theatrical version of it is pretty good, but mostly nonsensical because it needs about an extra 45 minutes of explanatory scenes to kind of join the connective tissue between everything so you can see how everything all kind of holds together and forms a cohesive whole so june i love the film of june um the theatrical version is pretty bad the tv version is even worse the only version of it worth watching is the edit uh which i'll post the link to um but on the basis of that it is the third best david lynch movie um and there, there you go so the second one, now you've got a couple of choices here. What what could it be? Um, could it be Twin Peaks? Or could it be The Elephant Man? Well, number two. The Elephant Man. Oh, that gave me a shock. Someone's running harsh, hot water. Uh, the Elephant Man is, is an incredible film. It's so warm and humanistic. And it's got so much optimism about the human condition. Um very powerful film uh, and John Hurt even though you don't see him throughout most of the movie uh, as John Hurt is deserves all the applause and, claim, and, and and acclaim that he can get for that particular role um, now this is a really really good film powerful touching important um, dripping in 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 hope and optimism for the future and, and the last scene is, 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 you know, it will break the hardest of hearts. If you think you're British and repressed and you, you've actually, your heart has been replaced by a stone, 
you don't cry at the end of the elephant man i'm beginning to think you might actually be a zombie uh, but it's uh, easily the second best movie that he's ever made um and and that's you know and it's a classic from top to bottom inside and out uh, just a great 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 movie not an easy watch but a very straightforward very linear very um very touching film that I rate highly and that's The Elephant Man which means number one must and can only ever be Twin Peaks but Twin Peaks isn't a movie but it is well it, it's all manner of things so Twin Peaks is uh, two TV series uh, one from 1990 to 1991 one motion picture from 1992 and one third series from 2017 and the only way you can understand Twin Peaks, and there's a lot of Twin Peaks here, gang, the only way to really understand Twin Peaks is to watch the whole thing in near enough one go. Now, it ends up being something like a 45-hour motion picture, uh, but it's an incredible ride going on Twin Peaks and experiencing all of it. I'm going to come back in a second. Hang on. So... Twin Peaks. I, I could talk for hours about Twin Peaks and how good it is. Um, it's my favourite thing by David Lynch, ever, by miles and miles and miles. And the only way I can really talk about it, in a way that makes any sense, is to start at the beginning and end at the end. So, uh, here's the, the gold box edition on DVD of the first two series of Twin Peaks from 1990 and 1991. Um, for a long time, Twin Peaks on DVD was really, really difficult to get hold of. And unless you'd recorded it or you'd bought very expensive VHS box sets, you weren't going to be able to experience what Twin Peaks was in a way that was really honest. Um, I watched most of Twin Peaks when it first broadcast, but I did lose interest after I found out who Laura Palmer's killer was. Which means that for decades, I didn't really understand Twin Peaks at all. Uh, it was really difficult to understand what it all was and how it all worked. Um, the first season is a very brilliant and beautiful extended length, kind of like really luxurious detective movie. Um, and I think it was only about seven or eight episodes the first season. Uh, the first season ended with um, Detective agent cooper being shot in the hotel and that was where the season one cliffhanger came to an end and then season two kind of picked it up season two really really difficult season and it's what drags down and spoils twin peaks i think uh, the, all the episodes in season two up to the moment where um, laura palmer's killer is revealed are absolutely essential viewing you can then skip the next eight or nine hours um, to get to the, the final episode. Um, now, the, the, the middle eight or nine hours after Laura Palmer's killer has been identified are completely useless to the plot. You don't need to watch them. They don't add anything to the story. They don't add anything to the lore. They just kind of extend out all the subplots and add a few extra subplots that you don't need and aren't interested in to pad out the time. Uh, the idea... I think behind this was originally when it was being made is that Twin Peaks as as the first season was such a success the second season was commissioned to be something like 22 episodes long and it didn't have 22 episodes of story that's in it. Now earlier on when I was talking about the TV version of June being padded out uh, with the extra footage that the, that the story really really needed uh, Twin Peaks seasons one and two are something like a 10 hour story shoved into a 20 hour bag and you can really feel the padding on those last few episodes. The the viewer rates just dropped off him dramatically and I, I must admit I really really lost interest when I was watching them again. I, I've watched them I watched them all in 2017. I've watched them again during lockdown um, to try and see is it any better. My short answer is skip all the episodes after Laura Palmer's killer is revealed until you get to the last episode of season two. But with those to one side, what you've got with seasons one to two of Twin Peaks is a thrilling, strange, unusual horror detective story. 
it can completely change the way in which you see the world and you get to the end of uh, season two of Twin Peaks and I won't tell you what happens even though it is over 30 years now so I think the, the spoiler time expiry period has passed um, is that you've got an insight into a world where there is a and certainly this is what I take away from it is that there is a almost like an evil that lives inside the universe and it feeds upon other people's misery it feeds upon people's unhappiness it manifests itself in things like murders crime uh disappointments lying all those type of things and that's what it needs to perpetuate and survive you know deception cruelty heartbreak those are the things that 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 huge and unspecified evil really really needs to stay alive and, and the idea being is that Twin Peaks an investigation of a murder that somehow opens a door to a revelation around this huge nature of of reality that there is perhaps a cloud of evil that travels over the world and it lands in certain places and then once it's finished feeding upon the misery of the population it moves on and by the way that's not my theory that theory comes from a film by called swimming to cambodia by spalding gray and spalding gray uh, plays a character in the film the killing fields and he has this brilliant film which was directed by jonathan Demme called swimming to cambodia where he describes how in his opinion uh, evil actually is a consciousness that travels over the world and it lands like a cloud on certain areas germany in the 1930s and 40s for example um, and it feeds upon people and then when it's exhausted itself and it's you know its victims are empty it moves on to something else and in twin peaks what i felt is a clear connection to that theory by spalding gray is that the city of twin peaks the cloud of evil landed upon the city or the town population i think was it 50 51,201 according to that there and it kind of feeds on until it's had enough and then it leaves just before it kills the host like a parasite like a cancer a cancer doesn't care it just eats and eats and eats the person until it kills the person but the evil in twin peaks kind of leaves just before it's too late um and that's what i got out of season one and season two and by the way I kind of got myself right into the lore of Twin Peaks in season one and season two. Twin Peaks was absolutely huge, of course. Uh, it spawned a number of, of spin-off books. Um, if you have an opportunity to get them, The Secret Diary of Laura Palmer was told to Jennifer Lynch, David Lynch's daughter, and the uh, the autobiography of FBI secret agent Dale Cooper as taught to um, as as heard by Mark Frost, uh, more correctly no, Scott Frost, who is the uh, either brother or son of the uh, producer Mark Frost, who is responsible for Twin Peaks. These two books, if you can get them, are essential reading. Um, they're probably expensive, but if you know where to look on the internet, you can probably find them as PDFs for absolutely nothing. Uh, but, you know, I devoured these really, really interesting and important backstory stuff. But, you know, Twin Peaks is still bloody brilliant without you reading the books. Then in 1992, uh, we came to another part of Twin Peaks, another part of Twin Peaks that we couldn't really experience on television, uh, which is Twin Peaks. Fire Walk With Me, the movie, The Last Seven Days of Laura Palmer. This is a heavy, heavy piece of work. It's really violent, graphic, brutal, dark as hell. Um, it does all the things that the TV show, the TV just wasn't ready to show at that point. Um, in, a, in TV world in those days, the kind, the kind of stuff that you needed to show was really, really graphic and brutal. Um, it's got probably the the most disturbing vision of an on-screen murder I've seen in a very, very long time in this film. Um, and also, if you watch it before you watch the TV show, you completely spoil everything about the TV show because you know who the killer is. Twin Peaks Firewalk with me is an essential part of the story and it needs to be viewed at the point in production, which is at the end of season two, because you from the end of season two, um, you go into an understanding of what is happening in the world of Twin Peaks, who the killer was and that nature of evil. And then all of a sudden you've got a flashback to the seven days previous, which explains how and why Laura Palmer was killed. And also about some of the other things in the series, which don't necessarily make sense until you've seen them. One of which is Laura Palmer's murder was not the first time uh, that, that a murder in Twin Peaks was attempted. 
Now, it's a great movie, by the way, Twin Peaks Fire Walk Me. It's also got David Bowie in one of his incredible on-screen appearances. And if David Bowie had only ever made movies and appeared as an actor, he still would have been lauded as an absolute genius. He's incredible in this movie, although he's only in one scene. And it completely blows your understanding of Twin Peaks apart. Uh, uh, and, go, and you suddenly go, God, there's another extra layer to all of this. There's even more to experience. Um, and then... In 2017, after Laura Palmer said to uh, Agent Cooper, "I will, when you see me again, I will not be me. I will see you in 25 years' time, or thereabouts, came 2017's limited event series, uh, which was made in, in 2017. It's effectively, and David Lynch has described it as one 18-hour movie. This is the best thing that David Lynch has done. It is an incredible piece of work. It's mind-blowingly good. Um, it, it completely blows the mythology of Twin Peaks apart in the same way that if you've seen Happy Death Day to you too, the sequel to Happy Death Day, uh, then you will know that Happy Death Day 2 makes you think, well, I thought I was seeing one thing, but now I'm seeing something else completely, completely different. This is an incredible piece of work. This is David Lynch's masterpiece, undoubtedly his masterpiece. Um, and if, if for no other reason, uh, it makes everything that's happened in the previous Twin Peaks absolutely even better. So Twin Peaks, the limited event series, um, has a, a series of highlights which are very, very uh, mind-blowing, actually. So when I was talking earlier about the cloud of evil that travels between various cities, various towns, you get to see that kind of mythology really explored in this, I'm really, trying really, really hard not to do spoilers, by the way. Um, but I have to spoil one section here, and I know at least one of you hasn't seen it, which is episode eight um, is an extended flashback to the moments of the first atomic detonation in 1945. And it, it posits the theory that that extended uh, flashback is actually the moment at which kind of tore the universe apart. And if you live in a, an idea that there perhaps there might be multiple dimensions, uh, multiple universes, uh, multiple strains and levels of consciousness, which, by the way, I've, I fully, fully subscribe to the fact that there are things that human beings cannot see or hear or, f hear or feel. So in terms of the, the five senses that we've got, um, you know, there are certain things that are all around us that we can't see. We can't hear radio waves. We can't see television broadcasts or mobile phone signals. We know they're real. We rely on them happening every time we pick up a mobile phone, every time we use Wi-Fi, every time we watch television or listen to the radio. So there are huge chunks of reality that human beings have not yet been able to see naturally with our own eyes and our own ears. And it's not that vast a leap to think that there are huge chunks of reality that we haven't yet been able to detect with scientific instruments. And this film kind of goes into, or, or Twin Peaks, the third season, goes into that theory and goes, well, actually, human beings are only one very, very small part of reality. Now, if you believe in uh, ghosts, the UFOs, uh, the afterlife, heaven and hell. Those are all concepts which shouldn't be alien to you, is that there are things that human beings are limited to understanding. And there are many, many things that exist that human beings either can't see or haven't yet been able to see. And Twin Peaks series and three kind of blows that theory uh, and, and takes it all the way through all of Twin Peaks. So there's a single unifying theory that started from a nuclear explosion, that perhaps that was the intersection point. Because you think about uh, 1945, lots of human beings, um, you know, there was a big rise in UFO sightings. People hadn't seen UFOs before 1945, before the first nuclear explosion. They'd kind of seen bits of it with the, um, I think, the LA incident in 1941, and, and a couple of others, but things like alien abductions uh, really, really rocketed up after the first nuclear explosions. The idea being that nuclear explosions were a great propulsive leap forward in human evolution and uh, suddenly brought, we broadcast our existence to the rest of the universe. Um, and not just the universe in terms of physical things that we understand, such as aliens, but also it might have, have, have you know, by tearing apart the atom, uh, mankind may very well have actually opened 
a doorway to an alternate set of universes, an alternate set of consciousnesses, of which, you know, we see, because our eyes and our ears are quite limited, mankind may only see, you know, the limited bit that goes out here, in the same way that our eyes can only see what's around us. We can't see what's behind us. Now, I know that stuff's behind me, and I know the sun is setting in the background, and I know it looks dramatic, but I can't see that with my, these eyes, because these eyes don't work in the back of my head. And what Twin Peaks does is it kind of goes, you as humans can only see a certain thing. And there's a whole bunch of other things which exist, which, you know, such as the nature of evil, the cloud of evil, which I talked about, which are signified through certain pieces of imagery. Uh, there's a character called the Woodsman, um, who appears in, in Twin Peaks and when you see the woodsman and you can see the woodsman in the Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me film you can see the woodsman in uh, the limited event series what they are is they're kind of like the earthly representatives of some great and unnamed evil that feeds upon mankind um, and Twin Peaks season 3 takes the character of Dale Cooper and shows what happens around the fragmented nature of our identities. Now, each human being has multiple identities. There's more to me than just being a guy that talks to his phone on, on YouTube. Not that you will see that. There's a guy that tweets angrily about politics. He lives in my head as well. There's a guy that dances badly when no one's listening to New Order. That's me too. You know, I'm all of these things. Um, and I'm a lover, not a fighter, baby, as uh, Muhammad Ali said. But, you know, there's a, a Pet Shop Boy song called Too Many People about the concept of there being too many people that live inside one person's head. Every part of our personality is multiple and rounded. And we have many, many different parts. of us. There's parts of us that we only show to our lovers, parts of us that we only show to our colleagues at work, parts of us that people who, who only see us in the pub see us. You know, there's, there's um, all these different identities. And, and Twin Peaks kind of explores the concept of multiple identities existing on multiple levels at the same time in simultaneous realities, whilst at the same point being quite clear about the fact that the evil in Twin Peaks, which is personified um, by a character called Bob, is not just that. It takes multiple, multiple forms. So David Bowie's character appears, even though David Bowie has died in real life, heartbreaking as it is to admit it, David Bowie's character appears as a kettle. Uh, that, that communicates through numbers and letters and hieroglyphs that are written in steam. You know, there's there's a scene where um, we explore one of the characters and suddenly you're kind of standing on what looks to be, uh, you know, a, a cube in space. Um, there's a, a, a vision of, of evil, um, which is occasionally glimpsed in the movie which is probably the most clear distillation and purest form of this cloud of evil around which i'm talking and that cloud of evil kind of looks like a black silhouetted shape that you're kind of like the tying in with the theory of shadow people if you know that that you know, which is kind of like shadows that look like people that you can see out of the corner of your eyes and then all of a sudden you go this is huge mythology which is completely blown the world of Twin Peaks apart and just has all these many, many other layers to the the world of Twin Peaks. And you suddenly thought, well, I thought I knew what it was about, but it's actually about something completely different. Um, Twin Peaks only makes sense. It only really makes sense if you watch um, the limited event series as well as seasons one, most of two, and Fire Walk With Me. And then you suddenly see it as really, it is very definitely his masterwork. Uh, and that is why Twin Peaks is, is my favourite of David Lynch's works. It's not a film, it's not a TV show, it's something else, it's an experience, it's a world that you can can live in. Uh, and even the you know the Blu-ray menus have like this montage of seven scenes, you know, three or four minutes around donuts or coffee or or um, you know clouds or water or whatever it was, and interstitial pieces. And it's just it's it's a phenomenal experience. Uh, to, to really get to revisit Twin Peaks as one entire unified object. Uh, it's one of the best sequels ever, because in the same way that Empire Strikes Back is one of the best sequels ever, because you thought you knew what was going on, and then all of a sudden what you've realised is actually you've only seen so much of the square, and there's a whole other universe that goes alongside it, which you need to experience. That is why I love Twin Peaks, and that is why I recommend uh, that you watch it. Um, by the way, uh, this version of Twin Peaks is called the Television Collection, and it's the entirety of Twin Peaks, apart from 
Firewalk With Me, which is available separately as a Blu-ray. Uh, this is currently, I think, £19 on Amazon for something like 29 discs. It is a monster, and it's well worth buying. Now, at that point, I'm going to wrap up. Hopefully, uh, that's been okay for you. I've really, really enjoyed talking about David Lynch. I love his work. He's a phenomenal filmmaker, and I, I think the world of his abilities. Um, also, uh, since he... Inland Empire was made in 2006. The only major visual material that isn't a short film is this. Um, but he's also made an album called Crazy Clown Time and another one called The Big Dream. They're well worth picking up if you can. Um, thank you. I'm going to wrap up here. And as per usual, uh, take care of yourselves and each other. And I will see you all again at some other time. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>